Welcome to Biblical Foundations for Africa, an in-depth look at the Bible as we learn how to discover God for ourselves as Christians in Africa. Join the Biblical Foundations team as they lead you through this exciting journey through the Bible. Let's get started. Good morning, faithful friends, and thank you for joining us once again here at Biblical Foundations for Africa, coming to you from Johannesburg in South Africa. You know, we exist to encourage every single African Christian to read, to believe and to understand the Bible for themselves and then to go out into every single sphere of our society and make Jesus Christ glorious. My name is Norma, your friend and companion in making sense of God's great word. This morning, we continue with our devotional series called Exploring the Covenants. The covenants are God's special way of establishing and maintaining relationship with his chosen people. So in this series, we're looking at eight of the major covenants that are found in the Bible. So far, we've learned something about five of these covenants. We've looked at the Edenic covenant, the Adamic covenant, the Noahic covenant, and the enduring Abrahamic covenant. And in the last two sessions, we started looking into the fifth covenant, which is called the Mosaic Covenant. And because this is a really big covenant, we decided to look at it in three parts. Once we are done with the Mosaic Covenant, we'll be left with three more covenants, namely the Palestinian Covenant, the Davidic Covenant, and ultimately the New Covenant. If you've missed anything up until now, please be sure to go back into our archives and listen to the ones you may have missed so that you are sure that you've got the full picture. So let's just do a quick recap of some of the ground we've covered in part one and part two of the Mosaic Covenant. Firstly, we discovered that this covenant was made strictly and only with the chosen nation of Israel. Secondly, we found out that although this covenant was made 430 years after the Abrahamic covenant, it wasn't actually a replacement for the Abrahamic covenant. The reason that this covenant was made was so that it could rehabilitate a fallen nation which was no longer honoring its covenant with its God. We also learned that there was another reason that this covenant was made. It was made in order to bring the whole world into the courtroom of God's justice, to show them the meaning of sin, justice, and ultimately to point them towards the Messiah who would be fully revealed in the new covenant. Thirdly, we learned that the blessings or the promises of this covenant were no different than the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. In fact, the blessings of the Mosaic covenant were designed to reinforce the same covenant blessings that were made in the Abrahamic covenant. Fourth and finally, we learned that the major difference between the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant is that while the Abrahamic covenant was a covenant full of promises, the Mosaic covenant, on the other hand, was a covenant full of conditions. We see this in the many if-then statements that are found in this covenant. In short, we learned that this covenant and its conditions or its obligations were designed to humble this people because as soon as they realized that they could not live up to the ifs and the conditions laid out in this covenant, they were supposed to cast themselves on God's mercy and grace to help them to do what they could not do in their own natural fleshly selves. So today as we finish looking at this huge covenant, we'll finish off by looking at two more things. Firstly, we will examine the terms of the covenant. And then finally, how this covenant points us most importantly to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and the guarantee of all God's covenant blessings. Now, the terms of the Mosaic Covenant can be summarized in what we have famously called the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were God's laws governing his relationship with mankind and with mankind's relationship with other people. God himself wrote these commandments on two tablets of stone. You can find this in Exodus chapter 20 verse 1 to 17 and then also in Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 1 and 2. The first four commandments were all about how we should relate to God. 
firstly, it said that we should have no other gods before him. You know, anything that is more important to us than God is a God. Even if that thing is a good thing like work or children or a husband or a wife, if it takes God's place in our lives or our affections, then it's a God. Secondly, we are not to make a graven image or worship graven images. You see, the custom of all the other nations around Israel was that they would make graven images of their gods and they would end up worshipping these graven images. God didn't want his people to fall into the same trap. For us today, a graven image could be anything that's made with human hands that can represent any of God's attributes. For example, some churches have made too much of holy oil, holy water, handkerchiefs, rituals, pictures, symbols, buildings, images, and so on that are supposed to be just representations, but they end up becoming a replacement for God himself. Thirdly, we are not allowed to take the name of the Lord in vain. In other words, we shouldn't use God's name loosely. This includes using God's name in profanity or merely using Jesus' name carelessly. How many times do you catch yourself using God's name carelessly? The media does it very often, and many of us are not as careful with the holy name of God as we should be. Let us take heed of this often forgotten commandment that charges us not to use the name of God in vain. And let's challenge other people around us not to use his name in vain either. The fourth commandment is all about keeping the Sabbath day holy to the Lord. In this matter, I don't think that the issue is whether you worship on a Saturday or a Sunday. I don't believe that that's the big deal. The big deal is that God set us an example where he worked six days of the week and then on the seventh day he rested. And right from the beginning, he mandated that mankind should do the same. Keeping the Sabbath day holy is all about making sure that you make time for you and your family and your workers to join in corporate worship with other believers, to take the time to rest and meditate on God and his goodness, to take the time to thank him and to celebrate him. There's definitely something powerful and special that changes our perspective on the rest of the week when we make time to ensure that the Sabbath is kept sacred and special by joining with others in worship. Now, the rest of the other six covenants were all about our relationship with each other. The fifth commandment was to honor our father and mother. The sixth commandment was a strict commandment that thou shalt not murder. The seventh commandment said, don't commit adultery. And we could extend that to any sexual activity outside of that which is sanctioned by God. It falls under this covenant. The eighth commandment would forbid stealing or taking by legal or illegal means anything that does not ethically or morally belong to you. The ninth commandment forbids bearing false witness or lying. And the tenth commandment said, no coveting. This means wanting what someone else has. This is a commandment we really need to hear in the 21st century because we live possibly in the most covetous century of them all. Coveting and wanting what belongs to other people seems to be a way of life. It's acceptable in our society. We want other people's houses, their cars, their husbands or wives, their children, their possessions, and the list just goes on. Yet the Bible says, thou shalt not covet. Now, this covenant required strict obedience from the children of Israel. But do you know what God really desired? Do you know what he really wanted? More than anything, God really wanted people who would obey him, not because the law was written on tablets of stone, but because the law was written on their hearts and they did it out of love for the Lord. God said this many times in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 to 6, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 to 13, and also in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6 to 8. God desired the love of his people, not just their dry obedience. God the Father still desires our loving obedience, not just our dry religious obedience. Okay, 
As we wrap up this covenant, let's quickly look at how this covenant ultimately points us toward Jesus Christ, who is the great hero of the Bible. Well, as we said before, this covenant is very detailed and we would spend a whole year talking about how each aspect of this covenant points us toward Jesus Christ. But we can summarize it into four major things. Firstly, the sacrifices of this covenant point us to Jesus. Secondly, the mediators of this covenant point us to Jesus. Thirdly, the tabernacle or sanctuary of this covenant points us to Jesus. And fourth and finally, the seal of this covenant, which was the Sabbath, points us towards Jesus. We don't have time to explore these in detail today, but very briefly. Firstly, the sacrifices. There were many sacrifices that were mandated in this covenant. Sacrifices of grain and bread and sacrifices of blood. All these sacrifices point us to the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that takes away our sins. Secondly, the mediators of this covenant point us to Jesus. The mediators were the people that stood between God on behalf of the people, administering all the rituals and rites required to honor and fully obey. There were three main mediators in this covenant. There was Moses. There was Aaron and there were the Levites who were the priests of the nation. The New Testament in Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ is the great mediator between God and man. And he has achieved what all other mediators in the past could not do by reconciling God to man. Thirdly, the tabernacle sanctuary points us toward Jesus Christ. Believe me when I say that when we do our next series about the tabernacle, you will be so blown away by how every single item in that tabernacle spoke of Jesus Christ. I can't wait to take you through that. Then fourth and finally, the Sabbath itself points us towards Jesus Christ. The Sabbath is all about finding rest in God's presence. And when Jesus arrives on the scene many centuries later, he presented himself as our true Sabbath rest. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30, he invited everyone who was weary or thirsty to come to him and he would give them true and everlasting rest. Let's bring our hearts before the Father and ask him to change them. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your covenant-making and covenant-keeping ways. Thank you that in the Mosaic Covenant you showed us how to relate to you and how to relate to other people. Lord, our hearts are prone to all the things that you said we must not do in the Ten Commandments, whether other people can see it or not. Lord, we cast ourselves on your mercy and grace. Teach us to say no to ungodliness and to make us people who love and honor your ways from the heart. In Jesus' powerful name I pray. Amen. Join us again in the next session as we move on to the next covenant in this series. Find us right here every weekday with a new installment of Biblical Foundations for Africa. Feel free to chat to us on any of our social media channels. Be blessed and remember as you go out today to make Jesus glorious. Thank you for joining us today on our Biblical Foundations for Africa lesson. To find out more information, join us on our website, www.biblicalfoundationsafrica.com. Also, we'd love to have you as our friend on our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. See you next time.